So now we move on to a completely different topic. We are now all done with mechanisms with correlated information, except as you will see, correlated information will kind of manifest itself here as well. And the topic that we will now begin and continue next week, as per usual, is that on dynamic mechanisms. So all the mechanisms and settings that we have looked at so far were inherently static. So there is just one piece of information that we want to extract from all agents, one round of reporting, one action to be done, and that's it. We never see each other ever again. All right? This does not necessarily capture all uh, real-world interactions that we are interested in, to which the broad question of mechanism design would apply. And here are some examples of dynamic problems in the real world. For example, um, if we have a buyer coming to our kebab stand there over and over and over again, so repeated interaction, the buyer's tastes may evolve over time, but at the same time, they can, uh, they already have a certain degree, they also have a certain degree of persistence. So once we know the buyer's preferences, we can use that knowledge against the buyer and extract all the surplus from the buyer by charging the buyer high price for what he likes, low price for what he doesn't like, and so on. Uh, alternatively, buyers can come and go over time, and you can also see this as a dynamic problem. For example, I have a house to sell, and buyers are arriving over time in my mechanism, but I only have one house to sell, right? Uh, procurement from firms with changing costs is another example. It's very similar to repeated purchases, but just on the other side of the system. So if, um, if we as a university are leasing this campus from a firm over and over again, then uh, the firm might have changing costs, the university might have changing value for the, for the campus for being here, and so on. Design of tax and social security systems is another example. Uh, same thing, tax. Taxation is usually a repeated interaction. You pay taxes every year, um, and eventually, when you're old enough, you get social payments. Or I guess not just them, but uh, you get health care, you get education in return, so all kinds of social payments. And you can see this as a dynamic mechanism, a contract between the government and uh, citizens. Finally, dynamic labor contracts. Again, same thing. We are interacting with the worker. The worker might have evolving ability, evolving preferences towards different tasks. Uh, so, you, if, uh, and we have a chance to value, to vary, sorry, the wage, or maybe to issue promotions at different times. So, another dynamic problem. And today we will see how to work with this setting. So how to frame those as mechanism design problems. And while this topic is covered in Burger's textbook uh, to some extent, I will instead follow this uh, survey by Bergman and Valimaki. I think it is slightly better written and it's a slightly broader overview. But I will not cover all of it. So basically in all of these examples, we have many different periods across which the interaction takes place. The question is, why can we not just take every period and frame it as an individual mechanism design problem? So we're solving a problem today, then we're solving a problem tomorrow, then we're solving another problem the day after, and so on. One problem at a time. Why do we need dynamic mechanisms? And why do we, uh, why is just simple static mechanisms not enough? The answer is there can be what I call linkages between different periods, meaning what connects today's problem to tomorrow's problem. And exactly as I told you, if you learn the buyer's preferences today, we can use this against the buyer tomorrow. And uh, this reflects linkage in information. So future private information of our players evolves from and therefore depends on the past information of those same players. 
and possibly on the allocations that we implemented. So the buyer's preferences may depend on whether they got to try the item or not, or whether they got to try something else, and so on. Actually, what I just said reflects linkages in preferences better than linkages in information. So preferences also usually evolve gradually, so they also depend on past preferences. So once we know buyer's uh, preferences today, we know something about their future preferences. Maybe not perfectly, but something. But the reason I confuse the two is you can represent preferences, uh, linkages and preferences, as linkages in prior information, right? What information I have about my own preferences? It's kind of the same as just my preferences in our, in our interpretation. Uh, but finally, one other linkage that is different is a linkage in allocations, meaning the allocation that we adopt today can affect the set of allocations available to us tomorrow. If I sell my house today, I will not have a house to sell tomorrow if a high paying buyer arrives. Yeah. And thing is, so the same linkages kind of apply if we try to take a different cheat and instead of splitting our long mechanism design problem into many small problems, we try to frame it as a one single static problem. Where, for example, the same player in different periods is just interpreted as different players. Right? If you recall, our general model was just very general. It had very little structure. So we could look at it that way. We could interpret it as a dynamic mechanism. Uh, the problem there is that is then the correlations in different players' information, for example, correlation in player of me today and me tomorrow, there will be some correlation between their information, right? So we'd have correlation between players' information. We would have a very strange set of feasible allocations if uh, linkages and allocations are in place. So it's just easier to... For, uh, look at these dynamics explicitly, rather than try to bend it into, into static framework. So, this is the dynamic model that we will look at. It is not the model, but it is a model. So there were some choices made in the representation here. But the model is as follows. So we have a number of periods, uh, small t, from 0 to 1 to big t. I missed one there, I wanted to fix that, I forgot to fix that, there should be one there. Uh, terminal time big T is finite or infinite, we don't really care. We have uh, the common discount factor delta for all players and the designer. So they discount future periods at the same rate. Players from 1 to n, so player 0 is the designer as usual. Players have evolving types, theta it. And we will assume that these types are independent across players because we have just seen what happens if they aren't. So types are independent across players. Uh, there is some distribution, uh, commonly known distribution. So there is commonly agreed prior belief that assigns CDF FI0 to the player's initial type. And the types evolve then as some Markov process. Markov in the sense that it only, my period, my, my type tomorrow only depends on what happened today. Meaning theta i t plus 1 only depends on t i t, on what type I had today, and on what happened today, so the allocation k t. But of course, more generally, you can assume more general uh, processes for type evolution. Now, every period, what we do with the mechanism is we want to select some allocation kt out of the set of feasible allocations big kt, which now can be, again, uh, can follow some process, which depends on where kt plus 1 depends on previous big kt and the chosen uh, allocation. And we will straight away assume that we have access to payments, formerly known as transfers. Here I just relabel transfers to payments PT 
because T now indexes time. So we have access to payments PT uh, for every player in every period. And we assume that player's utilities are quasi-linear, meaning that player I's utility in period T, given the outcome in period T, and player's type at time T, depends on, is given by some real utility VI of K and theta, minus uh, payment to the mechanism. So you can already see that the setup is a little bit more complicated. There are a little more indices floating around, and they are quite honestly a big pain to keep track of. So be careful with them on the final if you get a problem with dynamic mechanisms. Now, what do evolving types mean? Or how can what do they mean from the model perspective? Uh, how can this evolution of types proceed? We can basically see this as a three different kinds of evolution of types. We can think that there is some exogenous evolution of types, meaning that my type tomorrow does not depend on what allocations are implemented. It's just my, uh, maybe there's an example here. Yeah, procuring goods over time from a firm with stochastically evolving costs. And the firm's costs of production just do, do not depend on how much the firm sells to you because it just has enough other consumers of the same produce of the same product on the other hand you can have endogenous evolution of types where future types depend on kt and here you can think of learning by doing where again the more firm supplies to us the better the firm knows how to do this or um, yeah worker assigned to training by kt so kt is the decision whether to assign a worker to training or not before sending them to the field and sending them to training will increase their future productivity theta it plus one. But finally, the non-trivial way to see the evolution of types is to model the player's arrival. In particular, you can model random arrival of players as type evolution. So you can say that uh, if players are not physically in the market at any given period, they have some types, I know, type, type nothing or type empty, right? And whenever they arrive at the market, their type changes to something meaningful, like their valuation for the product or something like that. And this transition can, in principle, be random from the designer's perspective, at least. I know when I go to the store, the store does not know when I go to the store. So this is the evolution of types. And uh, here are some, some assumptions, some choices that were made in this model. So first of all, we are designing the whole dynamic mechanism at the same time, meaning that we assume the designer can commit to the whole mechanism at time zero, at the time when the mechanism is selected. We are assuming that all past reports and allocations are publicly observed meaning that at the end of the period it is revealed by the mechanism to everybody who reported what and what we did with it. And then it's true that based on that information players can update their beliefs about future types of all other players as well. So yes, beliefs will be dynamically updated conditional on this information. Uh, so we are kind of assuming as transparent of a mechanism as there is. Again, probably not something you want to do in practice. Auction participants really dislike uh, revealing information to other participants, especially if there are, these are multi-hundred million dollar auctions for spectrum, uh, spectrum bands. You really want to save every penny. Right, so there is transparency in the mechanism. Another thing related to principal's commitment to the mechanism, we will assume that contracts are binding, meaning that the players are also committed to the mechanism once they decide to participate in the mechanism at time zero. Meaning that if we care about IR constraints, we will only look at IR constraints at time zero. 
And there is kind of a relatively simple justification to that, which is um, you can ask the players to, yeah, to make some deposits, to put collateral when they decide to participate in the mechanism, which would be enough to retain them at all future periods. So if, if the player decides to leave the mechanism, they will uh, forfeit this collateral, and they will leave this deposit to the principal. So this is kind of a cheat to easily ensure IR in all future periods. We have introduced our environment. Just, you remember how we did it before? Broadly, the diagram that we drew. We have the environment, we have the mechanism, and we have the outcome inside this mechanism. And then we have maybe some goal, which ideally our outcome achieves. So we have introduced our environment. Now let's look at what can we do with the mechanism. And I guess we have also introduced the outcome, what it means. But let's talk about the mechanism now. <clears throat> As I've kind of already told you, we can in principle nest this huge problematic dynamic problem in a static setting, which means that all of the most general static results that we had still apply here. But you'll probably still need to prove them again. One of such results is the revelation principle, which to my own surprise last year was only uh, published three years ago. So we have a revelation principle for such dynamic mechanisms, which means that we can focus on direct revelation mechanisms, uh, in which players are asked to report their types every period. But this, however, is by itself more difficult in a dynamic setting. So what is a player's reporting strategy? A strategy, just in general, is a mapping from all points, from all nodes in which you have to take decision, into what you do in that node, at that history. So in the static mechanism, there was just one point at which every player needed to make decision. They just needed to choose what to report. So a player's strategy just prescribes one report for every type. Now, it's a bit more difficult, because a reporting strategy must map Action, uh, player's type and history into a set of reports. So a strategy should tell you what do you do at every type, at every history, uh, for every type. Right, then our mechanism is, what our mechanism should do is at every such history on which we focus, we should input players' reports from the current period, and we should prescribe some allocation and some payments. So our mechanism as a whole should prescribe a collection of such outcomes for every history and for every profile of reports. So our allocation KT maps profile of reports data and uh, current history into current allocation. And the same for payment, PT, and our whole mechanism, kappa pi, is a collection. So kappa is a collection of all such k's for all periods, and pi is a collection of all such p's, again, for all periods. I told you, it's messy. Cool. Now for the implementation concept. It was maybe a little bit tricky in the static setting to figure out what is the equilibrium that we will look at. And there we had domain strategy equilibrium and uh, Bayesian equilibrium, Bayes Nash equilibrium. In dynamic mechanisms, the question is even more relevant because all of this literature that was active in the 80s about proper equilibrium concepts uh, actually, for the most part, focused on dynamic games with incomplete information. And so, as a result, now, we have maybe half a dozen, if not more, equilibrium concepts that are in relatively active use, and a dozen more, at least, that are somewhat obscure, but some people remember them. So we have a lot of equilibrium concepts to choose from. 
To figure out which one should we choose, a good question to ask would be, why do we have so many? And the reason is uh, they mostly deal with the problem of off the equilibrium path reports. Just as I, just as we already kind of briefly discussed in case earlier today, in case of correlated information. Meaning, all of these different equilibrium concepts tell you what beliefs should you as a player in a dynamic game have when something unexpected happens. We will look at the perfect Bayesian equilibrium concept or weak perfect Bayesian equilibrium. And it says that well, you, in principle, can have any beliefs you want. So our equilibrium will prescribe some beliefs to all of that histories, but these beliefs uh, can be arbitrary, so there is no restriction on what they can be. They do not need to be quote-unquote reasonable, which is the goal of all the other concepts. So the, uh, the definition of perfect Bayesian equilibrium is relatively natural. I do not think there will be any issues with that. It says that every player must choose their reports to maximize their expected payoff, given their beliefs about other players' types and uh, all the other uncertainty. And these beliefs, on the other hand, must be updated by Bayes' rule whenever possible. And whenever possible usually means on the equilibrium path. I already told you what happens off the equilibrium path. Now, it's not really a big issue that we do not restrict beliefs of the equilibrium path because we do not really have, or we, think, we will think that we do not have any off path histories. Right? What is off path? When something unexpected happens. In our case, this would mean that somebody reported some profile of types that is not, that should not be possible. Another option could be that some unexpected allocation has been implemented, but that cannot be that cannot happen because the mechanism is publicly known and committed to. So the principle cannot deviate. The only possible way of path is some unexpected profile of reports of players' types. And we will just say that maybe distributions of types have full support or something like that. So no profile of reports is unexpected. This will not be actually the case in problems, but my point is, do not worry about these. Just focus on, on equilibrium path uh, analysis. Uh, 